anthropology, really, I'm very much concerned to develop cultural anthropology here in Ukraine because despite this country is so big, so diverse and has its long own academic tradition in historical studies in history and in ethnology and folkloristics, we still don't have any department in any university of cultural or social anthropology at all. It's now impossible to do from the up level, from the governmental level, but I believe that it's possible to do from the grassroots level and my colleagues and I were actually <coughs> doing this with our NGO, implementing different projects, organizing conferences, workshops, public lectures and talking loudly about anthropology. So uh, my article and my colleagues' article about why Ukraine need anthropologists was published even in Uriadovy Kurier, this is, uh, <laughs> this is a kind of journal of cabinet of ministers of Ukraine, but uh, unfortunately they didn't pay attention to why we need anthropology in such a conflicting country with some ongoing conflict, trauma and so on. Still, I'm optimistic and I think that uh, we are on the right way in, in doing applied anthropology in Ukraine. And now about film work in Dnipro. I won't overweight you too much about this theory because uh, it would be a strange thing having here at least three professional trained anthropologists or even more four and sociologists who do with qualitative research. So uh, I just uh, addressed the main idea when we decided to arrange a field work workshop here in Dnipro and what we are going to do, what we expect from each other and from you. So, uh, my idea was that to understand the city means not only to go on food, to have some excursions, to uh, make pictures everywhere and just go on the beautiful uh, way near the Dnieper River, but to understand the city means to encounter the city. And as far as you are the whole week in Dnieper city, I thought it would be very beneficial for all of you coming from different backgrounds, from different academies, from different countries to try to be uh, involved somehow in the city's life, at least in this short-term field work. From the very beginning I was um, thinking that we will arrange at least maybe three field work workshops during the school, but my colleagues stressed that only anthropologists will understand it and this is not a school of for training young anthropologists and just exchange our anthropological passion of how we behave in the field and what we how we do field work. Uh, so we just have only one field work workshop for three hours short term food work, very short term, but still I, I hope you will enjoy it and you will benefit from it. A uh, few words, what is what cultural anthropology is about and what it uh, means for me while doing research. I'm sure you, some of you will share this. First and foremost, anthropology is all about people. And as Tim Ingold wrote, to study anthropology is to study with people not to make studies of them. So uh, I will try to explain. So when we encounter with people, when we understand, when we meet people, when we uh, try to record them and when we not record <coughs> if they don't want it, uh, we experience many emotions which are highly important, I think. And sometimes um, I see that in academia and academic research those emotions we personally experience and people experience communicated with us are underestimated. Because it is important to pay attention on emotions and uh, processes of re-traumatization or healing effects of storytelling which I mentioned today in the first panel. Because uh, we can perceive this as a data as well, this is the first and uh, we can be uh, very careful talking to people, especially about some traumatic, uh, their traumatic experiences, especially about violence and post-violence, but not only about it. I personally uh, working in Poland, in Eastern Poland, and talking on such a, you know, topic as religion, not about war, not about trauma, but I still faced many challenges because asking about Greek Catholics, Roman Catholics and Orthodox and their relationships before the Second World War, I just opened, like, like archaeologists are opening the cultural layer, I just opened so many layers of trauma 
of different local communities and it is very difficult when you are talking to people and they are starting to cry and starting to say like oh like I want you to apologize for me for Volinia massacre and just you are trying it's very Polish Ukrainian relationship and it happened in 1943 and I've been asked uh, did your grandfather serve in Ukrainian partisans army did your grandfather was Banderovic for instance and uh, well it's it's difficult this communication is difficult and then uh, doing this research we are we are not trained how to cope with this psychologists are trained people who uh, heal and other people are trained but we aren't actually and I think that um, doing interdisciplinary research like anthropologists together with sociologists and psychologists perhaps will be a great benefit as we discussed before as well so cultural relativism again I borrowed this from the classics from Franz Gauss and Ruth Benedict like, Ruth Benedict uh, wrote perhaps very idealistically, but she was very right that anthropology is supposed to defend the world. Anthropology is supposed to make the world safe for human differences, for diversity, but unfortunately it doesn't. Because it was her perhaps idealistic view how anthropology should be done and still I believe in this, in her quotation, uh, which she wrote, but still, unfortunately, we didn't manage to save the world. <laughs> Perhaps it's a messianic goal, but uh, in my humble opinion, anthropologists are supposed to do this, and we are supposed to protect people who we work. Um, we can call this in another way, not uh, cultural relativism, but somehow uh, in another way, but uh, the point is that, that one person's or community's beliefs, uh, values, practices, expressions should be understood based on that person's, on that community, on that uh, locality, own culture, rather than judged from the uh, hierarchies, let's say, of Western domination culture, as it was on the very beginning of anthropology with its um, colonial nature. Uh, there is a great book of Larry Wolf, I'm sure you know it, in, yes, event in Eastern Europe, and Larry Wolf writes uh, about the perception of Balkan countries, about Balkans, like <coughs> Europe, Europe, but still not Europe. And this is the same, uh, I think, we all feel here in Central and Eastern Europe, and uh, when we are perceived like natives, like locals, and that's all. And, uh, I also face this many times going to conferences abroad when um, I have my presentation on one topic and I'm asked constantly about Maidan, about war and how do you live actually there? <laughs> this is, why you stay in Ukraine? It's like so, such a great misunderstanding. What are you doing in Ukraine with your English language? So, yes, it's a quotation from one uh, conference in Finland actually, so <laughs> yeah, it was a very interesting experience. So, I'm uh, talking about uh, not to be like uh, we can't to protect uh, ourselves from not being astonished or from not being surprised or from not being irritated doing field work but at least we can uh, try to reach this amic <coughs> or inner perspective of the people we encounter in the field and we can try at least to put ourselves on their place and to understand their vision of space, their feeling of belonging, and the way how they live from their perspective. This is attempt is what anthropology actually about. Ethnography, the core of anthropology, method of studying societies and people, a product of anthropological field work, a type of research and academic writing, and so on. This is, this is the heart of our discipline. Like, in the uh, Soviet Union and post-Soviet countries, um, there was ethnography or then ethnology, the name of the whole discipline, cultural or social anthropology. And I graduated from the chair of ethnology, actually. And in our region, ethnology or ethnography was much closer to studying folkloristics than to studying society. So now it's a change in a bit, again, from many grassroots attempts of some scholars who are still stay in Ukraine and try to change a lot from the grassroots level. 
participant observation, a way of collecting anthropological data by um, participating in uh, the daily life of society, of person, of some group, by our personal involvement in society's life. The context, I can talk a lot about context, because uh, in some research we really feel the strong lack of context, which is important. Context matters. We just can't um, interview several persons or even interview dozens of persons but uh, not talk about the context daily, they operate, they communicate with each other, how they perceive themselves and neighbors. And context is also about history. Yesterday it was discussion about, about history, actually. But not knowing history and not going at least a bit deep from the to the history of one random local community, we won't be able to understand why it is going on now, what we research now. So context and microsocial approach. Now there is there are even some anecdotes about holy wars between uh, quantitative sociology and qualitative sociology, and also between quantitative sociologists and anthropologists about how we perceive data, especially big data. So because uh, anthropologists sometimes are blamed for studying, focusing on very little micro level and studying only one local community or one case study in biography of one person, not looking around and not taking into account the global, uh, the global uh, things, the global um, phenomena. But still, this um, microsocial approach is justified because. Um, the periphery or the local community periphery is rather palliative, so the local community, some communities living still far from the center, they are the reflection on micro level of what is going on in the center, of what is going on on the global level. Uh, so these um, micro-social or in-depth case studies, they are aimed to understand the social complexity of societies and some particular uh, context on a micro scale. So this is just uh, some uh, some pictures from my own field work and uh, which illustrate the archetypical forms of ethnographic field work and gathering qualitative data, interviewing, participant observation and a uh, few notes. Uh, for me this was um, the most interesting participant observation in my life as, as ethnographer and anthropologist ever because I personally took part in several pilgrimages, being simultaneously a pilgrim and an anthropologist. And this is an uh, interdenominational pilgrimage going from Lviv, Ukraine, to a um, uh, shrine, Roman Catholic shrine in Poland. And this pilgrimage um, encompasses. Roman Catholics, Greek Catholics, and Orthodox. Uh, some of them are with very traumatic past experience of their families because they were expelled from Poland during deportations of 1944-46. And without this participant observation, without this engagement in uh, this uh, religious movement, without talking to priests, talking to pilgrims, I think I won't be able to reach the inner perspective of those people, their motivations, their aspirations, and their strong feeling of belonging to Eastern Poland, to Przemysl, to Subcarpathia region, and actually their intentions to engage in, the, in this pilgrimage. Uh, yes. Inquiry, not innovation. <laughs> Ethics of uh, field research, which I started to talk about. Um, addressing that anthropology is all about people and we have to protect those people we encounter with. Uh, in my traditional like, post-Soviet school of ethnography, which I was taught at the university, the interview was important. The interview was on the top of all, like being student of chair of ethnography and then PhD student of ethnography, you was obliged to conduct interviews. It was during my PhD studies, during writing my dissertation. I had to bring my supervisor like many interviews, and uh, it was like obligation. It was impossible to uh, explain that people don't want to be recorded. 
that people perhaps experience some personal troubles that people uh, feel not defended and that's why they don't want to be recorded. But still in uh, say English speaking academia there is a huge amount of literature dedicated to the ethics of research, the ethics of qualitative research, the ethics of ethnography, the ethics of field. And um, I'm keen on this approach of reflective anthropology. Kristen Hastrup and it started actually with the post-structuralist turn in the 70s. There is a prominent book by Paul Rabinov, The Field Work in Morocco. In this book, Paul Rabinov writes about his field experience in Morocco and reflects on colonial anthropology still at this time and writes about like, French ethnographers walking in Morocco and being highly colonial. And this book was, for that time, it was a great challenge for anthropology, for academia. And from this book, this field work in Morocco, this reflective tone in anthropology started. And Kirsten Hastrup, with her passage to anthropology between experience and theory, is the continuation of this reflective anthropology that empathy is just taken for granted. Like people do have to have empathy to each other. But uh, again, it's underestimated because when we are working even with communities that experienced trauma 70 years ago during Second World War and aftermath, we think that these wounds are old. But old wounds tend to explode and old wounds tend to be very hurtful. Again, it's my own experience working in Polish-Ukrainian borderlands with um, those people who uh, experienced three waves of deportations, 1944-1946, Greek Catholics and Orthodox, mainly Ukrainians, but also, uh, I don't like the term mixed marriages, but still they were from mixed Polish-Ukrainian marriages, who were expelled from Poland to Soviet Ukraine. Then those who were deported in the frames of Operation Vistula in 1947 from Eastern Poland to Western Pomerania, former German lands. I worked with the first, second and third generation of my age and even third generation being in the 30, more or less, they addressed this trauma in the ways that as if they were experiencing this deportation as themselves, not their grandparents. I know that we are talking about the phenomena of post-memory um, developed by Marianne and Hirsch, but still for me it was striking that people born as I in 1985, let's say 1986, that they can speak about uh, Aktia Visla, Operation Vistula, with such a big grief, with such a big pain, as if they experienced this deportation by themselves. So, this is about... Um, empathy and it's uh, highly important in uh, our field research. <coughs> this is the question not only to understand the other person but uh, to change our own way of thinking perhaps. This is the most important for me in, in my work because we have to question uh, constantly uh, how do we think, how do we perceive uh, and what is the field for us actually, how our feelings are changing in the process of field work. Recently I, I found um, such an approach of, as refusing research, this is the, mm -hmm. uh, the last position actually here by Tuk and Young. And it's a very interesting approach because the authors are talking about humanizing research and uh, about refusing not even to record, are refusing to talk to people if they don't want to, if uh, people experience sorrow, grief, and if they cry. Uh, and um, one example uh, just astonished me because the author describes uh, her talk with uh, an old woman who just uh, came to be very passionate and very excited about this talk and uh, she had a heart attack. So while Working with people, we can't, uh, of course, we can't avoid this, but uh, at least perhaps we, we can do anything not to lead our conversation to the respondent's heart attack. For me, it would be a disaster actually if, if it would happen in, in, in my field. Uh, without recording, what can we do when we 
needs information, when we urgently need information, but uh, when we can't record, we can write our field notes. If we can write, can't write our field notes, if uh, the person says, I don't want to share with you this, I don't want you to write this, I don't want you to fix this, perhaps we can only rely on our memory. <laughs> So-called head notes, again, the anthropologist Sherry Ortner wrote about the head notes as a way of, uh, again, fixing the material and training our memory because um, at least we can recover the surrounding, the landscape and uh, the context in which we were conducting our search. And now closer to Dnipro and closer to the city. Well, having such a lack of time now in our fieldwork in Dnipro, of course we won't be able to uh, do like urban anthropology because urban anthropology demands time, still a lot of time. But what I uh, encourage you to think about, about the city as a set of processes, not as a setting, not as a stable place. The city as a space where political power manifests itself in spectacular ways and try to reach this manifestation of political power and political changes. I think Dnipro is a very bright example of this manifestation of political power, political debates, even Yavarnitskova street we were walking yesterday. You may have noticed the two uh, flags, Karl Marx and Metro Yavarnitsky. So, I regret that there are no first, first, uh, the first name of this street actually before Karl Marx. Again, the city is a minefield of contradictory memories, which we also can uh, brightly see in uh, Dnipro. And as Tatiana Patrnova addressed in her lecture, city as a text we try to read. A Dnipro is a multi-layered city as perhaps every big city with contested history. So just the main task of our field work is try to read this multi-layered novel, let's say. Practical aspects. So, <laughs> how it will be uh, arranged, actually. Uh, each of group, group A, group B and group C uh, will have their own place. Those, those three places are all multi-layered places. They are historical and meaningful to the city and to the life of the city inhabitants. They all encompass contested memories since the Russian Empire till nowadays. Uh, they all can reflect and can expose local, regional and more broader national trauma and different traumatic experience. And they all are marked by civic activism, by voluntary activism, which is reflected in the landscape in different murals, signs and monuments. I won't tell you actually more about those places. Each group will be brought up to each of these three places. Group A will be guided by uh, Anna Matvedovska, Anna, please stand. So, yeah, Anna is local, so she will provide you to this place. Group B will go with Victoria, Victoria is sitting here. So you know already Victoria, and Group C will go with Denise. You know Denise, <laughs> so good. Uh, it's good to have here anthropologists. I'm blessed that we have anthropologists, but they are all mo mostly in Group B. So perhaps <laughs> would be the most <laughs> competent research from group one. But still, we have Edgebeta in group A and in group A, and Edgebeta already conducted her field work in Dnipro. So it's good. And group C, uh, we have Pekan. Yes, Pekan is local and perhaps can help with some uh, local specifics of that place you will be brought up. And of course, it's good to have Marina in Group B, because Marina is also local and she can help you. Um, your task is just to come to the place, to observe, to see. Of course, you will have not so much time, because three hours, it's, it's 
very little time. But still, uh, your task is to observe and to understand this place, try right? to reach what is meaningful in this place for local dwellers. Of course, you are not supposed to conduct interviews. In Ukraine, we don't have this um, developed in Western academia personal consent, so we don't sign papers with our respondents. So, and I think here it would even be quite intimidating for people to sign something which, uh, which just unknown people uh, badly talking in Ukrainian and Russian will uh, give them. So, uh, well. <laughs> uh, well, I'm not talking, of course, about locals and about uh, Ukrainian citizens, I'm talking about uh, the other scholars. Uh, while working in Poland, it was uh, one case when I was supposed to sign these consents, and uh, when people uh, who are knowing that I'm from Kiev, they were thinking that I'm a Russian spy. While Russian spy, it, it was very uh, difficult, actually, experience for me, but uh, nobody wanted to sign anything in Poland as well. So here, it won't work, actually, this signing personal agreements and consents. Just, um, as I see it, you are supposed just to ask people about this place. What is this? Uh, how do you perceive this? What was there? What does it mean, this monument? What does it mean, this building? What does it mean, this sign? So, and do some preliminary conclusions, but about it a bit, uh, a bit later. Actually, I was in Dnipro in September last year, and with Andy and Dennis, we were trying to cherry pick those three places for your field work. And Andy asked me to do this initial field work by myself. Um, it was a challenge. I was trying to ask actually people in Ukrainian and Russian in both my native languages about those places and uh, I never believed actually in this um, strategy to find the most, the oldest person, the local who was constantly living in one place because sometimes uh, people who are younger or who are in the middle age they can tell you more than the oldest person who simply will refuse to talk or will afraid to talk with you. But actually, in the case of Dnipro, the oldest were the most knowledgeable. So when I was asking the students or young people, they were looking on me with a big surprise and uh, was in a hilarious situation when a young couple was sitting near the monument drinking beer just in front of the monument. And I came to them and asked, what can you tell me about this place? They just look around to well, this is a park. Okay, I thought, and what about this monument? What monument? They asked me. Mm. So, uh, I assume that there also will be a, a, some challenge for you working there. But, um, but it's good, actually, this is all about field work and anthropology, it's all about challenge. And for most of you, it won't be anthropology at home. Even for those who are from Ukraine, because if you are from Lviv or from Kiev, it is a different case at all. So, it's just an example. First time I came to Dnipro was August 2014. I came here because a friend of mine, highly engaged in volunteer movement, uh, invited me to come here. And uh, at that time, Dnipro was a center of volunteer movement, perhaps together with me. <coughs> and she volunteered in a military hospital in Dnipro. And I saw this monument. Monument to Grigory Ivanovich Petrovsky, uh, who is uh, one Soviet Ukrainian authority who is uh, claimed to be responsible for <coughs> implementing Stalin policies of colonization and uh, Holodomor. Uh, but Petyana told me that uh, it is not so simply because he also wrote some letters to Stalin. Uh, telling him about the situation which was going on with uh, collectivization and Holodomor. Still, he was staying not far from the railway station and this cross to the victims of Holodomor and political repressions was staying in front of uh, Grigory Petrovsky. And then, then I came to Dnipro in September 2018, four years. There was no Petrovsky, there was only this cross. Mm -hmm. What happened in 2016 in the terms of decriminalization? Petrovsky had fallen, and for some time, I don't know long or not, there were only 
his boots <coughs> and the uh, card, which perhaps can be translated as murderer, murderer mm -hmm. in English, was written here. This, as far as I understood, this decommunization, well, the decision uh, was officially um, officially taken, but uh, the decommunization went by grassroots way. So he was just uh, speaking Bulgar, I, I don't know how to, to translate it again. The activists just thrown him uh, down. What a person coming to this kind of place for the first time can learn from this place. Only seeing this cross and seeing that perhaps there was something, but what? So the only way is just to ask people passing by what they remember about this place. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious actually to ask someone now what was there, what people will answer me about this cross and this place. So, uh, doing your short-term fieldwork in Dnipro, ask yourself uh, what can we read from some particular place. And I'm sure that this knowledge is something that perhaps can't easily be verbalized by people passing by, by strangers. But perhaps it would be readable uh, from the houses, from some signs, from something you can just observe. One colleague of mine from Poland says, uh, always told me in, in, when we are doing our field work together, you don't need, you don't have to just uh, brush and look for informants. You just have to sit near a cathedral and wait. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this was a good strategy, just to sit and wait for the people who will just ask you, what are you doing here? Why are you sitting just? <laughs> but it is just, but it justified perhaps only in some small rural communities in small towns when just people know themselves know their neighbors know each other and when they see you as a somewhat alien someone else coming from uh, the other side uh, I don't think in, in Nipro it will work actually of course if you will talk loudly in German or in English it will work but um, even uh, like Elżbieta said, oh, I'm coming to Ukraine, everyone talking Polish to me, I want to practice my Ukrainian. So even here in Dnipro she found a guy who talked Polish to her. So perhaps this will be uh, again uh, during our field work. Uh, when we are asking people what they remember, it's important to uh, ask them what they forget about, what stories they heard from their parents and grandparents and to think why they forgot about something particular and why do they remember the other things. So what particular they have forgotten already and what do they remember, so why? And what is the meaning of that particular place of those people passing by? Another example of uh, initial field work in Dnipro in last, uh, last year, September, was um, one beautiful park the place of mass shooting during the Second World War and extermination of Jews. And just a guy, a young student, is passing by this park and I am asking him, what was there? He just parked, it's always the park, and I'm asking him, okay, but do you remember the history of this place? He told me, oh, I'm not local, I'm from Krivovich, I just see the girls uh, running here and sometimes I observe them. So. <laughs> I don't know what was there before. Well, uh, perhaps you will also can hear such answers, but I don't know. Try to look for different people, not only for old or for young, but just uh, to have different voices and different opinions. Oh, yes, I like the Russian as well. It is written, Победа коммунизма неизбежна. The quotation from me. Communism's fortune is inevitable, but here you can see the first two um, Pobeda, first two signs were marked in the colors of Ukrainian flag in 2014. This is a picture again from August 2014. And it happens so Bida Komunizma Nis Bida Nis Fortune instead of fortune. Uh, there was a head of Lenin, as far as I understood, as far as I asked people passing by. There was a head of Lenin, of Bust Lenin, and in the June of 
2014, activists just dismantled this act. So I'm very curious if now to ask people whether do they remember Lenin's act here, will they talk about it, will they remember, and what they will say about Bida or Pabeda, Communism and Nizbezhna. So the uh, expected outcome of short-term field work. Uh, after field work in uh, yeah, on Sunday, you will have your short collective presentations of your initial field work from each group. We don't expect from you any theorizing or any big research or something like that. Of course not. But it should be your first-hand experiencing of places and communication with locals. This fieldwork is a logical continuation of everything you have already heard during this academy and of the excursions you have experienced as well. So it's not only this um, like being three hours on one particular place, it's all about your perception of Nipro you managed to, to have during this uh, summer academy. So each will have two hours for three groups, so each group will choose someone who will address the collective idea of your fieldwork from the group for 20-25 minutes. And then we will... <laughs> Ashbeta, you are already chosen, <laughs> I see. No, perhaps you could, uh, you could choose someone else. <laughs> um, and then we'll discuss each other between groups and between ourselves. It's your, your reflection about the city, your reflection about fieldwork and in encounters with local people, and some very preliminary interpretations of the field and of the city in general. Uh, I want us all to think and to discuss and to compare the ways um, how various society traumas and human tragedies are petrified in the city's landscape, not necessarily in Dnipro, but Dnipro as a bright example. Just how all this is forgotten and how it is remembered in each particular place. I would also talk about urban affect. This is a good term in anthropology and there is a lot of research on urban affect, especially concerning, if concerning Ukraine, about Chernivtsi and about Lviv, urban affect in Chernivtsi and urban affect in Lviv. But again, we are not doing urban anthropology now because it's a really lack of time. But um, urban effect is how political challenges, how religious debates, uh, how this um, um, interconnection or relationship between re religious and secular are reflected in the city's landscape and how different stories are, are petrified actually in the monuments, in houses, in these plaques, in these tables, in different commemorational signs. Uh, so this, this would be the task. And I think um, perhaps uh, some of you will find something beneficial during this encounters with Nipro City and uh, I would like, if you wish, during the, your project, your short-term fieldwork project presentations to talk about um, how this short-term fieldwork experience can relate to your own project, to your own research on post-violence and perhaps we can discuss mutually of the further strategies of uh, our research. I am personally more interested, as you perhaps understood, in ethics of research and in, in interdisciplinary approaches, in methodology we can use and, like, and share mutually together. Uh, and perhaps this will be the end, but after we will finish I will give you these um, cards in Ukrainian language on every participant of our academy. This is written that you are the participant of the academy and you are uh, take part in Dosliđenje istorične pameti meškanci mista Dnipro, that you are taking part in a big project of research and historical memory of Dnipro city inhabitants. So it's just, uh, you know, in case if someone won't trust you, if someone won't trust you, if someone just will ask, who are you? <laughs> so I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure you will, uh, you will need it. We just decided to 
to the, you know, just to keep everyone safe. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm very uh, sorry that I won't be with you tomorrow, but I will have to go to Kiev today's evening because of Fulbright Scholarship. <laughs> because tomorrow I have some obligations connected with this opening of this scholarship and so on. I just couldn't postpone this. <laughs> and I will come back on Saturday and of course on Sunday we will discuss together these projects. Uh, I think now this is all and I'm open for questions, discussion and uh, so on.